If you took my grade 11 physics course, you maybe remember some of the kinematics equations we used for displacement, for velocity, for acceleration. So we had a set of equations for those three things. But there were certain situations that we just didn't have an equation for, or we had to use multiple equations to get to some piece of information that we were trying to solve for. And we can, we can streamline that process a little bit by taking the equations that we know from grid 11 and doing some manipulations, some combination in order to make new equations that we can then use for a greater number of situations. So equation number one, new equation number one, it's not really a new equation. If you took my course, it was already on your formula sheet last year, but it's just a rearrangement of acceleration equals change in velocity divided by change in time. So the equation goes like this, v2 minus v1 over change in time. Okay, that's just expanding the, the change in velocity part. And now we're going to rearrange this into our new formula. So I'm going to multiply by the change in time, and I'm going to add v1. Okay, and what you end up with is v2 on the right and v1 plus a change in t on the left. And we're going to just rearrange that so that the subject is on the left. So we're going to go v2 equals v1 plus a change in t. Okay, now again, if you took grade 11 physics last year with us at the SR, then uh, you already had that formula. That's not new. Um, but it's a good reminder anyway. Now the second one is going to be entirely new. <clears throat> so there are several steps involved in, in putting this equation together, in deriving this equation. I want to I get there using a motion graph. Yes, everybody loves motion graphs. So we've got, we've got a line here on this motion graph see this one right over here this is a velocity time graph okay it tells you so it tells you how the velocity is changing over time and so if we're trying to calculate the displacement in this graph we would use the area under the curve okay and so that's here and here we need to create or we need to calculate the area of that shape okay um, the easiest way to do that is to split it into two parts and then calculate the area of those two parts. So let me show you how we get there. This uh, point right over here, this x value, we would call it t1. Okay, it's the time when this motion started. And then this one over here, we would call this t2. This y value right here, we would call this v1 it's the velocity that whatever this object had when we started and then this y value over here we'd call this v2 the velocity at the end okay and so to figure out the area of this shape um, we need to know the difference between t1 and t2 okay because that gives us the length of that rectangle we also need to know the difference between 0 and v1 that gives us the height of that rectangle and so then what we're doing to figure out the area of that piece of the rectangle um, we're gonna call it the first part of the displacement or d1 uh, just as a note uh, you will often see displacement written as change in x instead of change in D, but because in our school uh, we use the D notation throughout grade 9, 10, 11, 12, then we just continue with that in grade 12. <clears throat> okay, so D1, or the displacement for section number 1, is uh, T2 minus T1. That gives you this piece over here. Okay, so that's just the difference between T2 and T1. Um, T2 minus t1 so that's the length and then the width of it or the height whichever you want to say is uh, v1 minus 0 that's just v1 though right so v1 okay and that's the width or the height of this rectangle okay so we've figured out the displacement for that little piece or we've figured out 
an equation for the displacement in that of that little piece. So we can also call this t2 minus t1. That's change in time, right? Final minus initial time. That's just change in time. And so then that's times v1. So we can we can simplify this a little bit. So the first piece of the displacement is the change in time times v1. The second part, this triangle. Uh, we then need to know that the area of a triangle is the base times the height divided by 2, or half base times the height, whichever one you'd rather. I'm going to go base times height divided by 2 to start off with, and then we'll see what happens in the end. <laughs> so for this, uh, the base is that same change in time, right? It's t2 minus t1, same thing. And then the height of this triangle is the difference between v2 and v1. So it's v2 minus v1. It's the change in velocity. So the area of the triangle, which is going to be d2, is the base times the height divided by 2. And so we're just going to put in change in time as the base times the height, which is change in v, or v2 minus v1. divided by 2. Okay, so the displacement for whatever object this is on this graph is going to be those two things put together. It's going to be change in time times v1 plus change in time times v2 minus v1 divided by 2. So we're going to rearrange that slightly. So our first step here is displacement equals uh, v1 times change in t, so that's, that's the d1 part, plus uh, we're going to make the divided by 2 part in front, so half times change in v times change in t. Okay, and this is our d2 part, so this is displacement 2, this is displacement 1. Now this is a real ugly formula, and so we're going to clean it up a bit in step 2. So here's what we're going to do in part 2. We're going to take another equation and then combine it with this one. We're going to do a little bit of a, a merging of two equations, and it's going to clean it up a little bit. So we first of all want to remember that acceleration is change in v over change in t. Okay, and so if we rearrange that slightly to get v as the subject of that equation, we get change in v is acceleration times time. Okay, and the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm going to substitute that in here. Okay, so we're going to take this a change in t and substitute it in instead of that change in v. So now we get displacement equals v1 change in t plus half a change in t times change in t again. So we've got one last step to clean this up. There's no reason to have two change in t's multiplied together. We can just make that t squared. And so our final equation here, equation number two, is displacement equals v1 times time plus half acceleration times time squared. Equation number two. Equation number three is a combination of these two equations you see before you. And so what we're going to do is, is make time the subject of each of them and then set the two remaining expressions equal to one another. So it goes like this. I want to rearrange this displacement equation so that time is by itself. So I need to divide by 2 times r. So I need to divide by v1 plus v2 over 2. And so what that gives me is 2 times the displacement divided by v1 plus v2. That equals the change in time. 
So that's the first equation. Second equation, to get time by itself, I need to multiply time by the acceleration and then divide by the acceleration to get it to get the time by itself. So I get change in t is v2 minus v1 over acceleration. Vector symbols everywhere. Okay, so now I have two equations that are both equal to time and by what is called the transitive property they are also equal to each other. If a is equal to b and c is equal to b then a and c must be equal to each other as well. They're both equal to the same thing. So that's what we're saying over here that 2 times the displacement divided by v1 plus v2 forgive me for not putting in all the vector arrows because I'm just going to try and get through this derivation without all that stuff divided by acceleration. Those two things are now equal to each other. So my, my hope in this equation is to make v2 the subject. Okay, and I'll explain why we're doing all of that in a moment, but we're going to get v2 as the subject of, the, of this equation. And so in order to get this all into one nice straight line, we need to do some cross multiplying. Okay, so we're going to multiply by a and we're going to multiply both sides by v1 plus v2, then we're going to have a nice straight line equation that we can then combine some things and rearrange. And so what you end up with is t2ad. Okay, I'm putting things in specific places, in specific orders for a reason. Again, we'll get into that later. Equals v1 plus v2 times v2 minus v1. Okay, now I'm going to multiply the, all of this stuff out. So v1 times v2, v1 times v1, etc. And then rearrange it one more time. So what I end up with here is 2a change in d again. Still on the left. And then my uh, expanded formula on the right or expanded expression on the right which is v2 squared minus v1 squared. I said expanded and it's true it's been expanded but it's far simpler and so our last step is to just add v1 to both sides. So our final formula here is v2 squared equals v1 squared plus 2a change in d with all the vector symbols. So there's our formula. You can also square root everything and so you'd get v2 by itself rather than v2 squared, but this is the version that we're going to start with. Algebra as you wish after that. Now let me show you why this was necessary. What these formulas are made for. Our very first formula over here, notice what is missing. We're missing displacement. So in questions where you do not have displacement, that's perhaps the one to go with. Our second equation, we are missing v2. And our third equation, we are missing time. And the reason that's helpful is because you're constantly trying to, to match the information that you're given with what sort of relationship there is between those things. And those relationships we have given as equations. And so if the situation you're working with has nothing to do with displacement, you're not asked for displacement, you're not given displacement, it's a good indication that the first equation is what you're working with. And if you are tasked with a situation where v2 has nothing to do with it, then probably the second one is the one you're looking for. And same thing with time in the third one. It's just one more way of making decisions about which equation goes with which situation. Let's do an example of using the equations of kinematics. A ball rolls down a hill with a constant acceleration of 2.0 meters per second squared down. If the ball starts from rest, what is its velocity after 4 seconds? So the first thing that I always advise doing in these situations is write down what's the variable that it's asking you for. And in this case, what is, what is its velocity after 4 seconds? That's v2. Okay, that's the first thing I'm going to write down. 
After that, I'm going to go through the rest of the question and try and write down what is, what's the other information that it gives me. So it rolls down a hill with a constant velocity, not velocity, constant acceleration. And in fact, every situation in grade 12 physics that involves acceleration is going to constant acceleration. Okay. In order to solve problems without constant acceleration, you would need calculus. So, sorry, not for grade 12 physics. The ball starts from rest. Well, sorry, I want to write down the 2 meters per second squared. Okay, ball starts from rest. So that tells me that V1 is 0 meters per second. Okay, that's not, it doesn't tell you initial velocity equals 0 meters per second. You have to see in the, in the question, at rest means 0 meters per second. Okay, and then it tells me I'm looking for its velocity after 4 seconds. And so that's change in time equals 4 seconds. So now, judging by this list of uh, variables that I've written down here, I can tell that I'm going to use the first formula to solve for V2. Okay, because I'm given acceleration V1 in time. And the formula that I have for that is V2 equals V1 plus A change in T. And it's all nicely arranged perfectly for me to solve for V2 already, so I don't even have any algebra steps. So all I need to do is take my values, make sure that they're in the right units, which they are, they all match each other, and so that means I can put in my 0 meters per second for V1, plus 2 meters per second squared, that's my acceleration, times 4 seconds. <clears throat> okay, now, I decided just to put in 2 meters per second squared and not negative 2 meters per second squared because in this situation all my motion is happening downward and so I've just named down my positive direction okay you don't necessarily have to think about that in every single question when all the motion is directed the same direction then you can just work in magnitudes rather than concentrating on what are the directions of all my things um, and it'll probably work out the same way. You just have to keep in mind what direction you're working in. And that's this situation. It won't be every situation. So do make sure that you're, you're, you are cognizant of your directions. So V2 is equal to 2 times 4 is 8 meters per second. That's down the hill. Okay, we're just calling that down. And part two is how far did it move? So that is asking me for displacement. Okay, I'm not going to relist all the things I know from before, um, but I should remember that now I know V1 is zero, I know V2 is eight meters per second, I know the acceleration, I know the change in time, I know lots of stuff. So all I'm trying to figure out is how far has it moved? What's the displacement? So I can actually use a couple different equations here. Um, I can use displacement equals V1 change in T plus half a T squared. Okay, I can do that one. Or I could do uh, V2 squared equals V1 squared plus 2a change in D. I just have to rearrange that one. Uh, so I'm going to choose uh, this one over here, equation number one. It wasn't number one in the lesson, but they're not really numbered in real life, so who cares. I'm going to choose that one because I don't have to do any algebra with it. And because I know V1 is zero, that this term just goes away anyway. The same thing happens over here. V1 is zero, and so that term goes away. Um, but there's still a little bit more work to be done in the second equation. So... I'm going to use the first equation. Displacement equals half acceleration times time squared. So that's half times 2 times 4 squared. Um, all of these have units on them, right? So this is meters per second squared. This is seconds. I like to put the units in all over the place. Um, because it reminds me that I'm working in real quantities. I'm not just doing a math problem with pure numbers, that this is a, a, a real situation. 
Okay. And it helps me make sure that I'm putting the right numbers in the right place. Because I can double check my units and make sure that they work out to the right thing as well. Um, but sometimes I just get lazy and I just want to write down the numbers. Or when the equation is really, really long, then I don't put the put the units in either. So we're doing half times 2 times 16. which is in seconds squared, oddly enough. That's not really necessary. Again, if you didn't write in the, the units there, it's okay. Just keep track of them in the end. That gives you 16 meters. Down the ramp, but again, we're calling that down. Now, there's a couple things to remember that you always know that um, the question might not necessarily tell you, and that is brought up right here. Remember that the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. It doesn't have to tell you that in the question. You always have that piece of information. And if an object is thrown straight up in the air, at the top of its path, its velocity is zero. Right? An object that goes straight up like this, and then straight back down, up here, its velocity is zero. It has to come to a stop right at the top. So that's often useful for setting up kinematics equations because you can kind of split them in half sometimes. You know that the ending velocity at the top is zero. That's useful. 